All right, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we appreciate it. I'm Anthony Kuhn. Everybody calls me Tony. I am one of the managing partners for Tully Rinky. I manage the Buffalo, New York office, and I'm the chair of our firm's uh, military and national security practice groups, as well as chair of the national uh, the National Security Lawyers Association. And joining me here today is Ryan Nierney. Uh, Ryan is also a managing partner here uh, at Tully Rinky. He manages our California office, uh, and Ryan is one of our top security clearance attorneys in our practice group, and also sits on the executive board for the National Security Lawyers Association. So, Ryan, thanks for for jumping on and and joining me in this today. Great time, Tony. All right, just a, a quick disclaimer. Uh, those of you who are sitting in on this, we've got quite a few, I'm sure. I saw the registration numbers. Uh, nothing that we say today should be considered legal advice. Uh, so don't, you know, whatever we talk through today, don't think that, you know, an attorney has advised you to do a certain thing, so you should go take that action in a case. Um, definitely get legal advice if you are going through the adjudication or litigation process for your security clearance. We'd be happy to help you out, but. Uh, we just want to make sure that this is uh, this comes across as informational and uh, you know make it clear that we're not actually providing anybody uh, individual legal advice related to a specific case. So some of the things we'll discuss here today, we're going to talk about mostly the application and the adjudication or litigation process for the security clearance. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about public trust and suitability as well, um, but mostly we'll focus on the application and adjudication process for a security clearance. So we'll go through a discussion about completing the application. We'll talk a little bit about the SF-86, which is the security clearance application, and then the SF-85 or 85P, which is for a public trust, not a security clearance. Uh, we'll talk about building in mitigation and the different stages in the process, and then we'll talk about the actual adjudication of your application. So uh, what does it mean to have your application reviewed and released for adjudication? We'll talk about the investigation that will be conducted, and we'll talk about adjudications and the litigation stages throughout the security clearance process. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over now, uh, Ryan, if you'd like to chat a little bit about some of the prerequisites and, and the differences between the agencies and the way that they handle their security clearances. Yeah, absolutely, thanks, Tony. Um, so the first thing that anybody needs in order to obtain a security clearance is a sponsor. Um, that sponsor can come in a few ways, uh, the most common, um, well, essentially, it's going to be either a, a, a federal agency, right? So if you work directly with a federal agency, um, they would be the ones who would sponsor you, or it could be as a government contractor. You know, a lot of times these government con uh, these these companies uh, have government contracts that require access to classified material, uh, and as a result, um, those companies can um, put put you in for sponsor uh, for a sponsorship. Uh, so they would be the ones that would sponsor you for your clearance. There's also, uh, as you see here, a need to know. Um, that's essentially, a, um, you know, again, it could be on a contract you're working on. It could be just, uh, you know, for a specific thing. Um, but essentially, it would be a need to know uh, for specific um, classified material that you would have essentially a, um, uh, I guess we can call it a temporary uh, access, but essentially, it just be need to know for that specific aspect of it. Um, as far as the agencies go, there's there's a whole bunch of different agencies that obviously could sponsor you for a clearance. Uh, the most common that we see, because it's probably the biggest uh, government agency, is the Department of Defense. Um, and uh, the adjudication uh, body for that is DCSA, which stands for Defense Counterintelligence Security Agency. Um, and uh, so they're the ones that uh, primarily um, review and adjudicate uh, clearances. Um, there's also something called scattered castles, uh, which is essentially um, usually for the intelligence agencies. Those intelligence agencies, uh, you know, obviously we're we're probably all familiar with with who those are, um, but those are the ones that uh, are going to um, primarily put any eligibility uh, eligibility determinations, things like that, within scattered castles. Uh, just to backtrack a little bit, DOD and, and a majority of those use something called DISS. Used to be JPASS, but now it's DISS. Stands for Defense Information uh, System for Security, um, and essentially that shows what your eligibility for security clearance is as well. Um, and uh, you see on the bottom there it says using EQIP. Um, the EQIP uh, is essentially the electronic version 
uh, forms, um, and that kind of gets the process started, which uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll we'll talk about next there. Sure. Yeah, a lot of times there's confusion about equip. We'll have people call us and say, "I filled out my equip." Equip is the actually it's it's misspelled here. <laughs> equip is actually the uh, the 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 uh, the system. It's not the application. So your application is going to be your SF eighty five. Uh, 85p your sf86 uh whatever the documents are that you're using but equip is actually the system and the q the, the, the uh you should not be there but um so that's a system that is used and uh the agency would send you some type of invitation to go in um you know a code to use to go in and access your application and complete your application and a question that we get a lot is you know if, if i go in and change data or uh input new data are they going to see it and they are because of the system that they use. So you filled out an application before it stays in the system. And then uh, at least modern day, if, you, if it was a really long time ago, then they might not have that information in the system. Uh, they probably have a hard copy of it saved somewhere though. Uh, it, so if you have, uh, you know, input your, your information, your answers to questions in equip, and you go back five years later and you update that information, it's gonna flag in the system. And uh, that's where sometimes discrepancies come from when the investigator's investigating your case and uh, they might ask you questions about that. So um, just be prepared for that. For example, you did a security clearance application 10 years ago and uh, you said no to illegal drug use and you're now doing your periodic reinvestigation and you say yes to drug use in the past seven years, that's obviously gonna flag in the system the investigator is going to see that and they're going to want to talk to you about that because you have violated an adjudicative guideline while holding a clearance, which makes it more serious. Um, yeah, and then Brian touched on this, but the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the change to DCSA, the change to this, uh, there's a lot of different terminology now. We'll talk about it a little more in uh, future slides as well, but uh, there was this reconsolidation effort to clean things up, make it more efficient and speed things up. And it's really created a bigger backlog. It does every time. Uh, it's more difficult to get documents now. It's a slower process to adjudicate clearances now. Um, so it's actually made it a little more painful. So COVID didn't help, obviously. Um, so we're hoping to, uh, you know, come out of the backside and uh, of all of this, the, the transition to DCSA, uh, COVID, you know, everybody back in the offices and hopefully things pick back up and we can get some reasonable adjudication times on clearance applications in the future. Hey, Tony, and just one more point too, um, uh, just touching on the sponsorship. You know, a lot of times I get questions, you know, well, can I, can I get a clearance and then get a job or something like that? Because it makes it easier. You see all these job applications or excuse me, job postings that, uh, you know, require security clearance and things like that. But you have to have a company sponsor you for a clearance. You can't just say, Hey, I want a clearance and then, you know, go through the process. The company has to sponsor you or you have to have a need to know. Either way, there has to be some sort of government agency or government contractor involved um, at that point. And then another thing, uh, Tony talking about the equip aspect, um, you know, if you're able to, you should always save a copy of your equips, always, uh, because you never know when you're gonna need it again in the future. And, you know, like Tony alluded to, you know, with, with the transition to a different, um, you know, process, I should say, everything is taking a lot longer to obtain. Um, so if you have a copy of your SF-86, your SF-85, your SF-85P, whatever it is uh, that you filled out previously, it'll help you kind of speed things up at least a little bit going forward. Yeah, we'll talk about this a little more during the question section because the question came through about it, but. Um, as Ryan says, keep a copy of your SF-86 or your 85P because what will happen is you'll have inconsistent dates. And the biggest issue there is that the truth is easy to remember. So if you've got inconsistent dates, an investigator is going to catch those dates and they're going to make a big deal out of those dates. Even though you might not intentionally be uh, misleading anybody or intentionally providing false information, you have provided false information if your dates don't match up. One of those dates is wrong. So. Um, you know, do your best to estimate dates, save copies so that you know what dates you provided. It's very important in the future. All right, uh, jumping just to the next topic here. And uh, for those of you that are not aware of it, we have uh, a nonprofit that um, Ryan and I are both a part of that uh, is designed to train, um, you know, individuals in the intelligence community, uh, maybe people looking to be employed in the intelligence community, maybe even security officers. Um, the idea behind this organization that we created, which is the National Security Lawyers Association, 
is to create resources and content and put it out there for people uh, who have questions about what we do and, and what's done in the intelligence community every day. Um, and yesterday we did uh, our second podcast. Ryan uh, runs the, the National Security Lawyers Association podcast. So if that's something any of you are interested in, shoot us an email and we'll make sure that uh, you, you get uh, an invite to that podcast if you wanna check that out. Um, but this is a topic that we discussed in the podcast uh, just yesterday. So there is a lot of confusion between security clearance, security clearances and public trust. We had calls today uh, where individuals were confused about they wanted to get their public trust clearance. Um, you know, they're, they're different. So you have your security clearance and that is separate and apart from a public trust. So uh, a security clearance is an SF-86 and the security clearance is gonna deal with national security information. So that information that you need a security clearance to access, you need a security clearance for that. You cannot access uh, security, clear, security, national security information with a public trust. Uh, so you would fill out the SF-86, which can be pretty intrusive for those of you that haven't seen it. I believe it's, uh, I don't even know at this point, over 140 pages. It's, there's a lot of pages in the SF-86. So, um, and uh, there's different levels for a security clearance. You don't hear it often, but confidential is a very low level security clearance. Everybody who used to go into the military started with a uh, used to start with a confidential clearance, uh, very low level, but it's a clearance. It's basically a, a, a background investigation. Now there's a, a heightened requirement for security clearances if you want to be in the military. But the next level up is secret and then top secret. And then there's additional clearances uh, at that level that can be um, a little tougher to obtain and, and make you a little more valuable. Top, you know, TSSCI, um, a Yankee White, if you're working at the White House, there's a bunch of different high level clearances that you could go after. Uh, and the Department of Energy has different names for their clearances, but it's really the same level. Um, they just use a different name that they associate with the actual clearance. Uh, so there, there are many different levels for the security clearance and many different names, depending on the agency that you're going to. Just keep that in mind. Um, and, you know, there is this periodic reinvestigation and continuous monitoring. Periodic reinvestigation is where you have so much time between the last time you were investigated and granted access to cleared information until the next time when you have to be investigated again. And it depends on the uh, seriousness of the information that you're being exposed to. So if it's top secret, it's quicker. That's generally every five years uh, or six years. If it's secret, generally every 10 years, you would go through a periodic reinvestigation. You do the SF-86 all over again, meet with an investigator all over again, um, and go through the whole process. That's how it's supposed to work. It doesn't always work that way. Sometimes um, some corners get cut, but that's how it's supposed to work. Continuous monitoring or continuous evaluation system, um, which is more commonly CE or continuous evaluation, that's where there is a, a system in place now to monitor everybody who holds a security clearance. They're checking your finances, they're checking your arrest records, they're checking anything that they can verify while you hold the clearance as often as quarterly to see if you have tripped a uh, one of the one of the 13 adjudicative guidelines, potentially violated one of them. If you do that and you don't self-report that incident, then you're gonna have to answer for the incident and you're also gonna have to answer for intentionally withholding that information, which is a whole new guideline violation that you're gonna have to defend against, guideline E. Um, so. If you find yourself in the position where you get arrested, uh, you, you file for bankruptcy, your house gets foreclosed on, you fall behind on student loans, uh, you don't file your taxes on time, you know, all of those things get, will get your clearance revoked. If something like that happens, start to put the mitigation in place and make sure that you do a, a well-written self-report explaining the circumstances and um, providing that information before you get confronted with it. Because if you wait until you get confronted with it, it's a good chance you're gonna lose your security clearance. Public trust side of things, that's really uh, a, a really just a background investigation for individuals who are gonna be working for or in the federal government. Um, think, you know, this is, uh, you know, you, you, could, you could be in a position uh, with the federal government, obviously, that would require a security clearance, and many do. Um, you could be a contractor in a position that requires the security clearance because you're gonna be supporting an agency that has access to classified information or a company that has what's called a facilities clearance and uh, they'll, you'll be exposed to classified information that way. Um, but if that's not necessary, if it's not gonna rise to that level, then uh, you might go through a public trust uh, application, an SF-85P, and you're not gonna be exposed to classified information 
um, just a different type of, for lack of a better term, clearance. And I think that's where the confusion comes in because some people refer to it as a public trust clearance. But lower level, um, not national security sensitive uh, and not classified information. Uh, I, I plugged these in here just um, to talk a little bit about the, the mitigation that can take place in the application or at the application stage. There's different, uh, there's different stages where you can mitigate the government's concern. You can be proactive. If you know that you smoked marijuana in the past seven years, you're going to have to list it on your application. Obviously, that's going to be an issue. That's going to be a guideline H issue. This is your first bite at the apple. This is your first opportunity to mitigate the government's concerns. And I plugged a couple of examples in here. I'll talk about H and then Ryan will talk about F. Um, guideline H is gonna be your drugs. So if you used marijuana in the past seven years, it's still considered a schedule one drug, illegal drug, as far as the federal government is concerned, they don't care if the state you're living in claims to have made it legal. That's not possible as far as the federal, federal government is concerned. They're just not doing anything to enforce the federal laws uh, unless you hold a clearance or are in the military or something like that, then they enforce the law. So when you admit to using marijuana in the past seven years, they'll want to know about the recency, the frequency, and don't think that uh, this should scare you away and you're never going to get a clearance. I recently obtained a clearance for an individual who had just used marijuana right up until uh, applying for the clearance, used it for medicinal purposes, which, which the, the federal government doesn't recognize, but we use that as mitigation um, and, you know, laid out some other factors and that individual was able to get the security clearance. So there's no longer for, for some agencies, there's no longer this wait period of one year or two years. Um, and you, you, you might have seen, there was a publication recently that talked about um, it's no longer a, a bar from getting a clearance or an automatic denial of a security clearance. Well, that was misleading, that memo that came out because there wasn't one already. It wasn't an automatic bar. Uh, so that, that memo that came out clarified a policy that was already in existence and they, they pitched it as if it was some change to the law because more states are legalizing marijuana. It's not this positive. It's not gonna automatically uh, result in your denial. Now, if you used marijuana last month and your house was foreclosed on, and you owe student loans and you don't pay your taxes, okay, you know, now you're gonna have a problem, but it's the whole person concept that comes in there. It's all the different issues. They don't make the decision in a vacuum based on marijuana use. So don't let that scare you away, but be persuasive, explain the marijuana use, the recency, the frequency, and then plug in some of your mitigating circumstances that are spelled out in the adjudicative guidelines. So for example, it was under unique circumstances. Maybe you were in college and you were using marijuana with your friends, you're not in college anymore. So you're you're no longer in that situation. It was unique circumstances that are unlikely to reoccur because you're done with college. You have disassociated yourself from the individuals that you went to college with and were using marijuana with. Uh, you've sought treatment or an evaluation and your doctor thinks that you don't have a drug problem. Um, and if you did, you sought treatment and you haven't gone into remission or you haven't, you haven't uh, relapsed, I'm sorry. Um, and then a statement of intent, include a statement that you no longer intend to use drugs in the future. And if you do, you understand that your clearance will automatically be revoked. So those are all things that you can do and you can do them at the application stage. You don't have to wait to do that until you're going to court because now you're at the third bite of the apple and you're about to lose your job. You know, you have an opportunity to mitigate these concerns at the onset, at the initial stage of the application. And we do this, we help people do this all the time uh, and we can, uh, save you a lot of time and money down the road if we can get the application through at the application stage. Brian, you want to talk a little bit about guideline F? Yeah, um, so it's actually a good point. You brought that up, Tony, as far as like trying to get it done at the application stage, because that's actually really important for guideline F cases. Um, you know, a lot of times I see, you know, even if somebody was trying to do something, they get a statement of reasons issued, uh, which, you know, we'll get into, uh, you know, later on um, where they get their clearance revoked. Uh, one of the reasons or that I see sometimes is that they just waited until they knew about these problems a year, two years in advance, uh, but they waited till they got the statement of reasons or they waited until, uh, you know, they were notified their clearance is going to get revoked before they did anything about it. So if you could, uh, again, at the first bite of the apple, as, as, as Tony indicated, if you can try and provide that mitigation in your application, um, that is going to be some good mitigation uh, for anything in the future, whether you're issued a statement of reasons or not. Um, but obviously, our ultimate goal is to try and prevent a statement of reasons from being issued. But 
uh, you know, realistically, um, you know, th this is your a good opportunity to provide that uh, preemptive um, mitigation. Um, so specifically talking about the guideline F, uh, you know, it's important to kind of make a, um, a clarification here on this because a lot of times somebody is like, oh, I have, you know, $25,000 in debt, you know, are they going to look at that, you know, things like that. Um, most of the time, the adjudicating bodies are only really concerned about delinquent debt and delinquent debt that is, you know, 60, 90, 120 days, collections, what have you. I say most of the time because sometimes they do look at, you know, how that debt was accrued or, you know, if you have uh, an abundance of wealth, how that wealth was obtained, right? So if there's any criminal aspects to that, they're obviously going to have some concerns with that. Um, but ultimately, they're really just looking at any any delinquent uh, debts that you have. Um, and a good way to provide mitigation at the application stage is to address those then. Right, so, uh, you know, you heard Tony mention some uh, unique circumstances on the guideline H. Well, that's also applicable in guideline F. You know, you see on the bottom there, it says unique circumstances, victimized, you know, things of, of that nature. You know, if you um, had a whole bunch of debt racked up because of, you know, identity theft or because of uh, predatory lending practices, anything along those lines, those are considered unique circumstance, uh, circumstances um, that is, is mitigating. Um, the victimized aspect was recently just added when they updated the, uh, the adjudicative guidelines, I think in 2017, um, they didn't used to have all those additional exhibits, although they all, uh, excuse me, those additional examples, but they always existed. Um, but, you know, including things like that in your explanations, as far as why you have this debt, um, or why this debt accrued, uh, is important. Uh, another aspect that's mitigation as well is, um, uh, if you're doing anything about it. Um, and that's a big thing as well. You, you can't just sit and say, okay, well, you know, I'm hoping that these things fall off my credit report in 7 years and the government's <laughs> in the government's eyes. Uh, that's not enough. You have to make, uh, 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 what they call a good faith effort to try and resolve these debts, whether it's through settlement, whether it's payment plans, whether it's, um, you know, anything along those lines. Um, that's, that's a big thing. So if you start that mitigation now, uh, at the application stage, you can actually put that mitigation in your explanations on the SF 85 P the SF 86 or what have you. Um, you know, Hey, I have this debt with Citibank for 20, you know, $20,000. However, I'm currently on a payment plan with them for $300 a month. Um, and then, you know, I got this debt because I was going through a divorce or because I lost my job and I was unemployed for a period of time. Any of those circumstances are all mitigating. So if you can provide that information at this application stage, um, that's, uh, that's going to provide, uh, you know, the, the mitigation um, at the forefront. Um, and, and this isn't just for, you know, these are just examples that Tony, uh, that Tony had here, but I mean, this is for everything. Um, you can provide mitigation in any aspect of the, you know, Tony says 140 pages on the SF86, which is pretty accurate. Uh, but in any aspect there, if there's some concerns about past employment, if there's some concerns with, uh, you know, some, some alcohol issues, any of those things can also be explained and provide mitigation within that application as well. Yes, sir. And I say about 140 pages, because if you've gone and filled one out recently, you know, that the, the length of the form can actually change depending on your answer. So it now it, it's not just hard copy anymore. If you say, yes, it might create a whole new section that pops up, especially guideline. I and uh, psychological conditions and some other areas where they'll ask for additional information um, that might not otherwise be there if you said no. Um, but just 1 other thing to touch on right here is provide proof. A lot of people don't realize that when you submit the SF-86, you can actually submit PDF documents and things of that nature along with your SF-86. So if you are behind on your taxes and you make a deal with the IRS and you're you know, keeping up on that, you will have a letter from the IRS that says you're on a payment plan. Submit it with your SF-86. The investigator might not want to bother, might not want to be bothered with it. You can show the investigator and then go, oh, okay, good. I'll write it down. And they might not actually take the document. They should, but they might not actually take the document. So now you don't have it in the record and you had an opportunity to put it in the record when you did your SF-86. Um, we do supplemental submissions and there's opportunities for other things, but 
you know, the cleanest, easiest way to do it is just submit it when you get the prompt. Would you like to submit any additional documents? Yes, pull it right off your desktop or wherever you have it saved and submit it. All right, um, we will talk through the uh, just just kind of high level. We're going to talk through the adjudication and litigation uh, process here and. Um, we'll we'll, we'll kind of just break it down here and, and talk briefly about each uh, specific portion of it. So we've talked a little bit about the application or the initiation stage of the um, security clearance adjudication process already, but that is where uh, you get a sponsor. Sponsor says you have a need to know. They need you to get a security clearance. Um, as Ryan said earlier, you can't do this on your own. We can't help you do this. Uh, a lawyer can't say, uh, yeah, come to us and we'll get you a security clearance. It doesn't work that way. You have to get a sponsor. A company has to be willing to sponsor you and or an agency has to be willing to sponsor you. And once they tell you that they're going to sponsor you, you will get access to equip to go in and complete your application, whatever that application is. And that's the initiation of your security clearance process. That doesn't mean that they've started adjudicating your application. That doesn't mean you have any due process rights yet. You're just applying for the application. And sometimes when you apply for the application or when you apply for the security clearance, they will rescind the offer eventually and maybe never release the application. In other words, they'll never um, cut it loose to be investigated and adjudicated. So your first step in the process is to fill out the form, um, gather all of that information, and there's gonna be a whole bunch of it, and provide the most accurate information you can, look over past applications, Look over uh, your if you if you filed an OF 306 for a federal employment position, if you have previously filed an SF 86, 85, 85P, if you've joined the military, uh, you know, look over your answers and um, check to see if you're going to provide something that's inconsistent with those answers. Look at your passport. Most of the time now, these countries don't stamp your passport when you do international travel. So, you know, check your bank records when your ATM card was hit in another country, um, different things. There's different tools you can use to try to figure out when you did that international travel, but you're going to have to report that international travel. So make sure that you, um, you know, do a little bit of homework and, and be as thorough as possible on the application. Don't over report. Don't answer a question that's not there. So, for example, you're going to be asked if you have used an illegal drug in the past seven years. Don't say, you know, I snorted cocaine eight years ago. You just put yourself in a position you didn't have to be in. Um, they, they're going to ask you about education. They're going to ask you about employment, uh, where you lived, all of these different things. And they're going to put a limit of time on each of those questions. Stick to the limit of time. If they wanted more time, they would ask you in the application for more time. If they wanted to know, um, if you had other psychological conditions other than the ones that they specifically ask you for, they would they would have asked you that. So they're they're very careful about the questions they ask. You don't have to try to interpret them. Just read the question. It's very clear. The only one where it kind of can go gray area a little bit is on foreign contacts. Um, and I think we're going to talk about that a little bit from one of the questions that came through um, because agencies can interpret foreign contacts to be different things. But for the most part, all of the other questions and answers are right there. Don't say, well, I think I should add this too. You shouldn't add it. If it's not responsive to the question, you shouldn't add it. So just, you know, complete the application, answer the questions that are asked and be persuasive, not objective. Be persuasive in your response section. Don't just provide the information in an objective manner because it can come across very negatively. And an investigator can key in on some of those things because, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna interpret that information based on their life experience, and maybe they never smoked marijuana. Uh, maybe they never did certain things. So you have to make sure that you build that mitigation in and be persuasive. You're giving them the information, but you're providing mitigation at the same time. Ryan, anything you wanna to add to the application stage? I know we- Yeah, just, just a little bit. Um, just like Tony mentioned, make sure you're reading the question because the SF-86 and the SF-85P, they look similar, but the timeframes are different. Um, you know, and the SF-86, they're going to go back 10 years, um, you know, for your housing and, you know, your school and things like that. Uh, it's only five years on the SF-85P. Same thing with drugs. It's only five years, I believe, on the SF-85P. On the SF-86, it's seven years. Um, financial is a little bit different as well. So make sure you're actually reading the question um, and only providing information based upon what that question is asking for. 
You know, I, I usually always say, you know, if they're ask if the question's asking what color is the sky, don't say the grass is green. Um, so, so that's kind of, uh, that's, that's, that's my two cents on that one. I think they're both at seven years now for drugs, but I, I could be wrong about that. But yeah, I mean, that's an awesome uh, analogy. <laughs> the sky is blue, though, the grass is green. I mean, it, it, that's, it happens a lot. And um, we defend people where we're litigating the case for them. And I, I sit there and, you know, why, why did you give them this information? Now, now we have to do a written response or we have to go to court and, and um, you know, have a court case over information that it's not responsive to a question. There was no reason to provide that information. It's good to want to be honest. But don't do an investigation on yourself and provide additional information that they're not asking for because you think it's relevant. Uh, make sure that you're answering the questions that are asked. And the investigator might ask you some broadening questions. Uh, that's fine. Answer the investigator's questions. If you go in front of the investigator, this happens a lot. And the question is, have you used marijuana in the past seven years? And you say no. You go in front of the investigator, and the investigator might ask you, have you ever used marijuana? Okay, now I have to say eight years ago I used marijuana. But you don't have to do it on the application. And then um, if we have to litigate a case like that, the first thing Ryan and I are going to say is it's outside of the statutory period. There's no reason to, to talk about marijuana use eight years ago. The investigator exceeded the scope of the investigation and you know, we'll most likely be able to mitigate those concerns. Uh, it's possible and don't lie to the investigator, but just make sure that you're answering the questions that are asked on, on the application itself. Um, Ryan, you want to talk a little bit about the investigation stage? Yeah, so uh, the investigation stage, it actually, the, the entire process starts as soon as you submit your application. Once you submit your application, then uh, typically what happens is, is that an investigator is assigned to your case uh, and they basically go, go through your entire application and get any information that they're going to have about, um, you know, uh, your ability or, or eligibility to hold a security clearance from, from that form. Now they'll also do like a ba uh, a background check as far as like criminal and you know pull your credit report things like that where they can get some additional information, um, you know. But a lot of the information that they're going to be reviewing is going to be information that you provide. Um, so that kind of starts the process with the investigation. Uh, you'll have an interview with an investigator. Um, they didn't used to have interviews for every level of clearance, but now they do. Um, they're going to literally the, the majority, if not all the questions that an investigator is going to ask you are going to be based upon the SF 86 or the SF 85 P and the information in there, or like I mentioned before, any of those documents that they, uh, obtained the criminal record check, the financial, um, uh, credit report. If anything pops up there, they'll ask you about those as well. Um, and as Tony kind of mentioned before, uh, you know, sometimes they, they'll go beyond the scope, right? So if they're asking you about drugs, like, as Tony said, and they, uh, he said, have you ever used, you know, marijuana? Have you ever used cocaine? Anything like that? You know, obviously you want to make sure in those, uh, interviews that you're answering those questions honestly and truthfully, um, because you don't want to come back, uh, as a personal conduct issue or that you're lying in this investigation. So even though that question by an investigator would be outside the scope of what's asked on an SF-86, um, that is still, um, that is still uh, something that you want to be truthful about. And you see here it says second bite. Um, and the reason why we put second bite there is because it's literally your, your second opportunity to provide mitigation, whether that's from something that you already submitted uh, on your SF-86 or it's something that maybe you just didn't think about initially um, and, you know, now you're like, oh, darn, I, I forgot to put this information on the SF-86. Um, and if you remember it before you have an opportunity to submit like a supplemental to the SF-86 or something like that, this would be your opportunity to provide that information to the investigator um, before you're confronted with those facts. Um, and I say before you're confronted with those facts because that's actually a mitigating condition for guideline E allegations. Um, if you try to correct the record or correct omissions or correct any falsifications or anything like that before uh, the investigator asks you about it, um, then uh, you know that that's a mitigating aspect that you can um, that you can utilize. Uh, the last point I have on this is that uh, the investigator is not the adjudicator. Okay, the investigator is not going to be the one who's going to be making a decision on your clearance. That goes to somebody else. The investigator essentially is one who's gathering information um, to uh, to provide to the adjudicator who's going to ultimately make that decision. So I, I get that question a lot, you know, 
oh, the investigator says that, uh, you know, there's some major concerns here with this and, you know, whatever. And that may be true. There may be some major concerns, but ultimately it's not the investigator's job to make that determination. It's going to be with a, a, a separate individual or, uh, or person who, who's going to be making that or adjudicated body, I should say, who's going to be making that decision. All right. Um, yeah, I agree 100 percent. And it's, it's usually. Uh, I guess it depends on what information is on your application. I've never had uh, information that's too crazy on my application, but um, when the investigator comes out, most of the time, uh, it's not a very long meeting. You know, they go through, they talk you through the application, anything you want to add, anything you, you left off. Um, and I mean, my most recent, for me, um, I hold clearances through different locations, um, but I, I have a military, my, my clearance through the military and then, um, I've also recently gone through a TSSCI high level, you know, government clearance, and it was a very quick meeting. You know, we went through all the information because he'd already done a thorough background investigation on me. You know, I'm sure he already saw my other SF 86s and things of that nature. Um, and, you know, we were done. But if you have a lot of information on their tax issues, uh, finance issues, uh, criminal, criminal history, things of that nature, it's obviously going to be a longer uh, meeting. And if it's something where you're doing a pre poly or something like that, you're going to go to a polygraph. That's a different type of investigation, different type of interview. You're going to be there for a long time. So, um, the actual SF 86 review, though, shouldn't be too long as long as you do a good job and you provide really clear, concise information on your SF 86. And there aren't a bunch of different potential allegations that could be triggered with the information that you provide should should be relatively quick. Um, as Ryan said, uh, that you know the next step here in the process is the adjudication. As Ryan said, the investigator is not the adjudicator. Um, your security officer is not the adjudicator. There is no judge assigned yet, anything like that. Um, your packet is going to go forward, and it's going to be your SF-86. It's going to be um, tons of notes, hopefully, that the investigator has has gathered, interviewing interviewing your uh, references and reviewing documents. And these notes are going to go forward. Um, your packet's going to go forward to an adjudicator. And they're going to, and, and every agency does this pretty much the same way still until this point. Um, the the application is going to be reviewed, and their their standard is whether it's clearly consistent with national interest to grant you the clearance. So they're going to go through and they're going to look at your foreign contacts. You know, is there a reason to think that you're uh, going to resolve a conflict of interest in favor of another country over the United States? They're going to look at um, your sec, you, you know, if you had to disclose sexual behaviors or things like that, that could be an issue. Are you are you open to coercion and blackmail and um, you know are you susceptible to those things such that the government has a reason to be concerned about you being in possession of national secrets? Um, they're going to go through the application and adjudicate that and see if they think that any of those uh, issues exist or what we call concerns exist. Could be drugs guideline H. Could be finances guideline F. The examples Ryan and I gave earlier. And once they identify those potential concerns. Are they mitigated in the application? Can you mitigate those concerns with the information that you provided in your application, the notes from the investigator, the additional documents, if you plug some additional documents in with your SF-86? If you can mitigate the concerns at that stage, then the adjudicator is going to say, okay, good to go. You're going to get your security clearance. If not, then you're going to get a notice of intent to deny or revoke. Very rarely there's a step in the middle there where they might look for more information before the final adjudication. You might get written interrogatories. Um, you know, sometimes there's some psychological condition stuff that can happen where they want you to get an evaluation, things like that. Um, but that's rare. And for the most part, you'll go forward and it'll be adjudicated and you'll either get the clearance or you'll get the notice of intent to deny or revoke along with what's called a statement of reasons. And that's exactly what it sounds like. It's a statement of reasons why they think that you're a risk and why they think you shouldn't be able to obtain or keep your security clearance. And that statement of reasons will go right down the line and say, you violated guideline A because you're part of an extremist organization, allegiance to the United States. You're part of an extremist organization um, and we have concerns about you know what, how you would act around government officials, things like that. Um, and then you have, now you have to go back and try to mitigate those concerns because now the allegation has been made. You weren't able to mitigate them in the application, so you've got some work to do uh, and it'll go right down the line A, B, C, D, and then it'll tell you which one they think you have violated, which one they're alleging you have violated. And then right below that, usually they'll provide more details on this specific violation that they're alleging. 
And a lot of people read this and they say, that's it. They denied my clearance and they stop right there and they're upset about it. Or they call us and they say, you know, I got denied a security clearance. You didn't get denied a security clearance. If you back up to what I said, it's called a notice of intent to deny or revoke. So they're putting you on notice that they intend to deny or revoke your application. If you read further, they'll tell you in that document that you've usually got 30 uh, with COVID. They've sometimes started just making it 60 days, but either way, usually they'll bump the 30 days out to 60 days. If you just request an extension, um, even military personnel, you can request it right there through your security office. Uh, but the 30 to 60 days to draft a written response, which is the next step or the third bite at the apple. And Ryan, if you want to chat a little bit about that. Sure, uh, just a point, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's commonly referred to as a, a letter of intent or a statement that contains a statement of reasons. Some agencies use different verbiage, but it's the same thing. Like NSA is clearance decision statement. The Department of Energy is summary of security concerns. It's, it's the same thing. Um, no, you you'll get notice of proposed action sometimes and it's really talking about the security clearance. Exactly. So, I mean, there's, uh, you know, there's different names for it, but ultimately it's commonly referred to in the security clearance realm as a statement of reasons, regardless of what it's called with the actual agency. Um, and, uh, essentially if you are issued a statement of reasons in that regard, um, you usually, as, as Tony indicated, you usually have a, a certain uh, period of time in order to respond. Um, to those allegations or those specific concerns um, and provide mitigation uh, to the adjudicating body as far as why um, these allegations should be mitigated and why you should have a clearance. Um, you know, sometimes it can be as, as little as I've seen as little as seven days to respond, which in my opinion is ridiculous. Um, and sometimes you said it's, it's up to 60 days or, or even longer, uh, you know, for some, some places. Most of the time, if it's a reasonable agency, you know, the DOD usually are willing to grant extensions as well. If you need some time, um, you know, that's obviously not a guarantee. It's up to the agency, but, you know, you can always request an extension if, if one's necessary. Um, and sometimes they are. And the reason why that's, uh, that's important is because when you submit a written response, uh, you want to make sure that you're not only addressing the allegations in the statement of reasons, but you're also providing supporting documents to back that up. Um, I've seen a number of, you know, sometimes uh, people come to, you know, Tony or me or, or you know, um, somebody else and uh, they, they're at the hearing stage, uh, which we'll talk to in a minute, but we look at their written response and the written response is basically just, I deny uh, or I admit, and that's it with no explanation, no supporting documents or anything like that. Um, sometimes they'll, sometimes they'll hand write, I admit or deny on the statement of reasons and send that back, but that's not going to get you anywhere. Yeah. And, and, and to be honest, that, that is, um, the instructions that you get sometimes with the statement of reasons are very poorly written. Uh, sometimes they'll even instruct you to just say, I admit or I deny specifically on the statement of reasons. Um, which is, is not the best route to go because your ultimate goal in a written response is to try and mitigate the, the security concerns that the government has. If you just say, I admit, or I deny right on the statement of reasons, that's not going to do it. Um, you need to provide a, a, a full explanation to each 1 of the allegations. Um, you also need to provide uh, mitigating information, right? So like uh, Tony was talking about guideline H before, and I was talking about guideline F, you know, there's mitigating aspects for each uh, adjudicative guideline um, that you can argue, obviously, if it, if it fits your situation. Um, you know, there's a, a disqualifying and mitigating conditions for uh, each of the 13 guidelines, um, and that's what needs to be discussed in the written response. Um, and then there's also something you heard Tony mentioned it before, something called the whole person concept. Um, they look at not just the snapshot of what the, um, the statement of reason says, or, you know, whatever is in, you know, the past SF 86s or whatever, they look at you as an entire person. So that's why it's important to not only provide information and documentation based upon the, uh, the allegations themselves, but also, uh, provide some, you know, supporting character evidence. Um, that uh, that would be beneficial to kind of back up uh, that whole person concept uh, aspect of it. But in the written response, it's very important to make sure that you're you're providing 
uh, a full explanation, both of the situation itself and the mitigation, and also providing some supporting documents in order to back up what those arguments are. Um, you know, and you, you never want to waive any right to a written response or a hearing. Um, you know, uh, obviously you can make that determination with whoever your representative is or, or what have you, but, uh, you know, obviously the, um, the more chances that are taken away from you to try and mitigate these concerns, the harder it is. So you never want to waive any right for written response or, or the next step, uh, which is a hearing, which, uh, which Tony can talk to you about. Sure. So the hearing is your 4th bite at the apple and depending on the agency might actually still be your 3rd bite at the apple. So department of energy, for example, um, your best bet is usually just to push them to a hearing. Um, if you do the written response, you might waive your hearing and you don't ever want to waive your right to a hearing, uh, because that's really your best bet to get in front of a judge or get in front of a decision maker and, uh, present your case. And now they have to deny uh, a well-dressed articulate person who, um, talks well and, and mitigates the concerns there in person, as opposed to stamping a, a stack of papers. Uh, so your hearing is usually your best opportunity for success. We win a lot of cases at hearings that were not mitigated or we weren't able to win in with written work product. Um, so, you know, don't be discouraged and don't say, I'm not going to go to a hearing because I've already lost at the earlier stages. There's a chance you'll still win. Uh, there's a decent chance you'll still win. You'll also have more time to mitigate whatever the issues are. By the time you get in front of a judge or a decision maker, it, it, it could have been a year since the last time you did whatever the, the issue was that they're stuck on could be could be longer. Um, so don't be discouraged by the fact that you have to go to a hearing. We call it a hearing. Some agencies call it a personal appearance. Uh, sometimes it's in front of a Doha judge, like a DOD clearance is always going to be in front of a Doha judge. Um, sometimes you're going to be in a, like DHS, for example, you're going to be in an office in their headquarters with an attorney and somebody from the security department, and that's your personal appearance. Uh, it can be informal. You sit around at a table and you talk through whether you can mitigate the concerns or not. Um, the Doha hearings are, are more formal. You've got an actual administrative judge and department counsel, which is kind of like the government's prosecutor for the security clearance case. 99% of them are, are not adversarial. Uh, the hearings, you know, they go pretty smooth. It's really just fact finding. Every once in a while, you'll get uh, a, a department counsel who just, um, you know, I don't know, they, they, they take your case personal. And I've had a couple where, I mean, I just, objected a lot and I don't like to object in a security clearance hearing because it's probably not going to be sustained anyway. Um, but, you know, you, <laughs> you get every once in a while you, you'll land with a diff difficult department counsel, but most of the time people get nervous about going to security clearance hearings or personal appearances and they're usually not adversarial. So don't be uh, afraid to put yourself in that situation. They just want to talk to you and get the facts. And the judges are all very good. I I've never had a bad uh, incident with the judge. They're professional. They'll talk to you like you feel you deserve to be talked to. Um, they're not going to talk down to you or, or belittle you in any way, no matter what the issue is that you're there in front of them for. We've had some issues that um, I know people are uncomfortable talking about in a courtroom. The judges have seen it. You know, they, they'll talk with you. They'll, they'll be respectful and they'll try to figure out whether you can mitigate the concerns. Um, government will put into in documents into the record your SF-86, uh, certain things from the record, investigators notes. Um, and very rarely they'll put the investigator on. I've only had it happen one time um, and it really worked out well for us because it was somebody that um, clearly went above and beyond, exceeded the scope. My guy knew he was a Marine and a combat veteran and all this other stuff because he talked down to my guy the whole time and told him, you know who I am, here's what I've done. Uh, and it really helped us when we litigated the case because it really showed that our, our client was kind of bullied in the process and we were able to establish the clearance for that individual. Um, so they don't put, people like that on often and they don't like to be adversarial often because the judges don't want to see that either. You know, the judges want a respectful proceeding in front of them and they want to get the facts on the record. That's all they're worried about. So um, they'll put their their case on. Usually they don't call witnesses. Uh, they'll defer to us to call the applicant as a witness um, and then we put on our case. So sometimes you'll have witnesses. We always put the applicant on. Um, maybe put mom on, maybe put a coworker on, uh, somebody that can testify to character, uh, any factual evidence, things of that nature. Um, you know, we don't usually go more than two or three witnesses and we'll put together a written submission and then that's it. Uh, the, the hearing plays out, the personal appearance plays out very rarely. Uh, I know DHS will do this, but very rarely the agency will contact you after the hearing or after the personal appearance and say, Hey, let's work something out. Uh, and we didn't say this, but um, Ryan's great at this. 
on occasion, we can even get the the case um, really favorably adjudicated before you ever get to the hearing. So sometimes we'll pick a case up between the written response and the hearing, and um, Ryan especially is able to negotiate. Hey, look, if we get this mitigation and and um, you know get rid of this allegation, and we can we can we can mitigate this, and he'll actually provide evidence to mitigate the concerns. And occasionally they'll say, okay, you got us. No no reason to go forward with the hearing. We're going to go ahead and grant the clearance. So Ryan's really good at doing that. Um, it's a lot of people aren't able to do that, um, but he's very good at negotiating those types of things. But we're on to the hearing. You complete the hearing. And then now the judge is the one that's going to issue a decision. Uh, the exception there being military personnel. If if you're military, um, so for everybody else, the hearing is the the last step before you get what would be a final answer, a final decision. Um, everything before this was proposed, uh, and now you have a final decision that you can appeal. Uh, for military personnel, the written response is the last opportunity before you get a final decision that has to be appealed. For the military personnel, you would appeal the written, the decision from your written response, you would appeal that to a hearing uh, or in writing, but we always urge that you appeal it in a hearing, and then that decision goes forward to an appeal board, we call them the PSAB, um, but the judge would send a recommendation forward to the PSAB and the PSAB would uh, make a, would issue a decision at that time. Slightly different than how the other agencies do it, but when you get this far into the process, every agency changes it up just a little bit. Um, but DOD does it the same way every time. So, um, yeah, and Tony, just on that point too, uh, it's also federal employees. If you're a DOD employee, they do the same thing in the same way for, um, for military personnel. So that personal appearance is essentially your appeal. Um, mm -hmm. and then after that, you know, again, the, the difference between a contractor on the DOD side and a military personnel or, or DOD federal employee is um, that the administrative judge for the contractor side and makes the final decision and then there's a written appeal aspect. Uh, the other aspect for the military or federal employees is that the written response is your uh, essentially your 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 opportunity uh, and the appeal is the personal appearance and that administrative judge at your personal appearance only makes a recommendation to as Tony had mentioned before PSAP um, and uh, I would say, I don't know, what, 97% of the time, Tony, the, the PSAB goes along with whatever the judge recommends. So, um, you know, yeah. obviously that makes the personal appearances and the hearings really important, uh, an important aspect uh, to provide as much mitigation as you can. Yeah, I mean, they, they don't, they're not in the room, the judge, the, the PSAB's not in the room. So unless they have a really good reason to to tell the judge that he doesn't know what he, or he or she, they don't know what they're talking about, they're going to go along with it. So uh, on a rare occasion, they'll disagree, but, um, and then I'm going to move this along really quickly here, Ryan, but just quickly, your last step is the written appeal. Um, so if you get a decision back from a judge and that was your last bite before you got the final decision, then you'll do a written appeal, which is a high standard. It's difficult. It's no longer, you can't put new uh, information on the record. In most cases, you have, you're stuck with what's on the record um, and you are stuck trying to convince the judge, the, convince uh, an appellate authority, the board, that the judge made the wrong decision. Uh, they abused their discretion. It was arbitrary and capricious, something like that. It's no longer necessarily an issue of um, the actual facts, but now you have to use the facts and the, the information that is on the record without providing new information um, that the judge got it wrong is really the standard. So a little tougher. Uh, we're just going to talk through a couple of things that came up um, that come up often. So obstacles to getting a clearance, we've, we've touched on these just briefly, but the two main obstacles to getting a security clearance are going to be loss of jurisdiction and a previous denial. Uh, so your loss of jurisdiction is where you lost your sponsor, maybe you were fired or you thought you'd leave, you know, before getting fired or something like that. And you were already in the middle of some type of investigation. If that happens, you've got an open investigation and you lost your sponsor at the same time, there's a very good chance that you're going to go into a loss of jurisdiction. You've heard flagged in the system, flagged red in the system. Um, there's all these different terms that are used as slang, but you're in a loss of jurisdiction. The, the main way to get out of a loss of jurisdiction, really the only way is to uh, find a, um, a new sponsor and the new sponsor is gonna know that you're in a loss of jurisdiction, that you're gonna have to find a new sponsor and get them to submit a customer service request to uh, put you back into adjudication or, or uh, you know, finish the investigation that was essentially frozen when you left your 
employer or your sponsor. Used to be an RRU or request to research, rectify and upgrade, but when we changed from JPAS to DIS and changed over to DCSA, they changed the terminology for this as well. So it's a CSR now, not an RRU. Um, and only your new sponsor can initiate that. So we help people often deal with the sponsors because a lot of the sponsors don't really know that they can do this or how to do this. So we'll jump in and we'll write them a letter and explain and help mitigate the concerns and um, prompt the uh, the filing of the, the CSR and get people back into the adjudication or investigation so that it can play out. Um, previous denials, this is another one that Ryan is, is really good with. Um, you know, if a case, if, if you have gone through the adjudication process and you have been denied, depending on the agency, and I'll use a couple of examples. So if you're denied by, I don't know, Coast Guard, or we'll say CIA or something like that, or maybe FBI, but now you want to get a DOD clearance, it's possible that you'll still be able to apply and get the DOD clearance because it's a different agency and it's a different process. Uh, but if you have been denied a DOD clearance within the, uh, you know, at, at any point, really, if you've been denied a DOD clearance, if it's within the past year, you're not going to be able to reapply yet. Once a year passes from your denial, you're able to submit a new SF-86 and apply for a security clearance, but they're going to want a reapplication brief. So your reapplication brief is uh, a legal brief, or I mean, it doesn't, I guess it doesn't have to be a legal brief, but we draft a full legal brief. And the goal there is to mitigate whatever concerns you failed to mitigate when the last uh, application was was processed and, and adjudicated. Uh, whatever resulted in you getting denied or having your clearance revoked in the past, that's what you now still have to overcome because you weren't able to mitigate it last time. You now have another opportunity to mitigate it before they'll give you a security clearance. Anything you want to add there, Ryan? Uh, no, uh, it sounds good. The only thing is, is like you said, it's just um, not every agency requires that or allows you to do that. Um, you know, specifically for DOD, that would be something that they would need specifically for contractors, to be honest, that would be something that they would need before they can even process uh, any new investigation for a clearance. Um, and it's from the date on the DOD contractor side is from the date of the judge's decision that the 12 year uh, 12 months starts, not from the date that any appeal board decision comes down. All right. Uh, suitability versus clearance. Just briefly, we'll talk through this. Just think of these two as employment versus security clearance. So we get a lot of people who contact us because the, the language is very similar and they tell us I got denied suitability uh, or they told me I'm not fit uh, and they gave me 30 days to respond, uh, something like that. They think it's their security clearance. What happened there really is that they're using the information that you have provided to them to make an employment decision to, to withdraw the conditional offer. Um, or potentially withdraw the conditional offer if you can't mitigate the concerns. You have to get through, in most cases, not always, you have to get through suitability and fitness before they'll release your SF-86 and actually adjudicate your security clearance application. So they should go in that order. Sometimes they get mixed up, but they should go in that order. Um, what can be confusing is you might fill out your SF-86 and then your agency or your employer might actually use the information on your SF-86 to vet you for suitability or fitness. So you you disclose drug use, um, criminal conduct, things like that. They might then say, "Oh, now that we have this information. We're gonna we're gonna withdraw this offer and say that you're unsuitable or you're unfit." A lot less due process here. Um, it's an employment decision. It's not a security clearance decision. If it's a security clearance, you'll have the opportunity to do a written response, uh, go to your personal appearance, things of that nature. You've got a lot more due process there, and um, the security clearance. Uh, you'll only have to go through that if it's actually necessary for the position. Remember, we said earlier, you have to have the need to know. The need to know is that you're in a position where you're going to be exposed to classified information that you need to know. So they will put you through the security clearance process. Anything there, Ryan? I'm going to jump to these questions here. Oh, sounds good. Covered it. Right. All right. So we pulled some questions from the uh, registration that, that we got earlier and just plugged them in here. We'll talk through them really quickly here. So how do you regain your clearance? We talked through this already. Um, we talked through the uh, reapplication stage and we talked through the loss of jurisdiction. So I, I hope that answers that question. If you're in a loss of jurisdiction status, you've got to get your new sponsor to file a CSR. If you had your clearance revoked, you're going to have to go through the reapplication process. And the, the time that it takes depends on the issues that exist. So obviously, if you're going to um, continue to have a hard time adjudicating the application, you might end up in court and it might be a year from today. So it could take you a year, it could take you four months for a secret. Um, so you really, we, we don't know how much time it would take. Uh, it's gonna it's gonna depend upon which 
stage you're able to favorably adjudicate the clearance. Um, so I haven't registered with Selective Service. Can I still get a clearance? Ryan, you want to take this one? I know we, we've just done this. Yeah, actually, I think yeah, you'd be probably the better person to talk about this, and you, you're the one okay. that just did this. <laughs> sure. So we've got a couple of cases like this right now. I just had one not long ago. Um, what they did is they actually flagged the individual on suitability because he never um, he never filed for Secret Service or I'm sorry, Selective Service. Not the first time I've done it. Just a unique one because this, this time and they alleged that under suitability and not the security clearance. Um, but as we had some really good reasons for it. So if you've got really good reasons, um, this individual had had, had uh, migrated to the United States, um, and you know it was uh, it was a case where we were able to um, show that there were reasons, uh, you know, good reasons why this individual didn't register. Um, some individuals we have they go into the military or attempt to go into the military, and they think that it's already handled, but they never actually ship, so they didn't end up registering, but they don't know that. Um, sometimes there's there's unique circumstances, but really what we have to do is we have to file a form and um, on that form, we we the way it's worded is kind of funny We're we're seeking, um, you know, we're seeking the status of the application, even though we know the individual didn't apply. Um, but it's something that we have to do to kind of check the box and and help explain what happened. Uh, and then they confirm that the individual didn't register, but now they're tracking the individual, even though you might be too old to register. Um, and as long as we've got some good mitigation, we should be able to get the individual through anyway. In that case, the individual was found suitable based on our response and uh, recently obtained a security clearance as well. So uh, it's possible you can get both suitability and security clearance if you are able to mitigate the concerns. All right, this was one uh, an individual asked a question about, I think, a DUI and some other stuff. and. Um, you know, wanted to know, you know, if I get arrested, but I'm not convicted, it's dropped, or I go back and do something to to mitigate the charge. Um, do I still have to list that charge? Does it matter? Absolutely, you do. Um, the question specifically says, have you been arrested, convicted, or whatever in the last? I think it's the seven years, if I'm not mistaken. So, yep. um, so yeah, absolutely, you need to list it. Um, now, as far as if the conviction matters, it matters, I guess, as so far as the mitigation goes, right? So, if you ended up not being convicted of it, uh, then that's a good aspect for mitigation. But as far as if it needs to be listed on any SF86 or SF85P, um, the question specifically says arrested. So, even if it was expunged. Um, even if it was, uh, you know, again, you were found, you know, not guilty or what have you, um, it still needs to be listed, but then you can provide that mitigation, uh, in your explanations as far as what the outcome was, especially if that outcome was favorable for you. Right. And there's certain traffic violations that apply here as well. I think the limit they set is a fine over 300 hours. So pay attention to the, the language on the application and that will answer your question as to whether or not you have to list it or not. Um, explanation of foreign nationals. So who do I list? This is a question that we deal with and I wish we had a really good answer for you. Um, you know, everybody's confused about this one, but the question is whether you have closer continuing contact with someone with whom you or your spouse or cohabitant uh, have a bond and they'll talk about different types of bonds right there in the application could be money, business, um, you know, there's a there's a bunch of different, and, they, and they're clear that this is not a, a fully enumerated list. There are additional circumstances, so they're looking for a bond. Most agencies use that language, and they want to know if you have close or continuing contact at any point in the past seven years with someone with that with whom you or your spouse, cohabitant, etc., uh, are bound by, and it could be anything. You know, uh, it could be any type of bond. So if if a person falls into that category, meaning you're you're repeatedly checking in with them, uh, or you're occasionally keeping them updated on your family, that's con that's continuing contact. If you have close contact with them, they're a family member, something like that. Uh, you're you, you're intimate with them, things like that. You you have to disclose that. Um, it should be a foreign national. So if it's a U.S. citizen. Pay attention because if they renounce their citizenship, they're a U.S. citizen. Stuff like that. Sometimes people get confused just because they started in another country doesn't mean they're a foreign national. They could be a U.S. citizen. So sometimes you don't have to list those individuals depending on their status and whether they're still a dual citizen or uh, haven't had citizenship yet in the U.S. Um, so pay attention to those things. Don't assume somebody is a foreign national. Don't assume that. I get a lot of questions about, well, I think this person that, that I know from this place is uh, from Mexico. Why? Because they speak Spanish. Don't assume that 
uh, they're a foreign national, don't list them. If you don't know that they're a foreign national, don't go and um, you don't have to dig into this. You don't have to insult somebody and say, hey, do you belong here? Are you a US citizen? Don't do that. If you don't know that they're a foreign national, you're not responsible to list them as a foreign national on your application. Um, if you have a reason to know it, then you should find out and you should list them as a foreign national. If you employ them or something like that, you should know and you should list them on your application. Um, but you know, the, 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 the big difference here with one agency, um, and you can probably guess which intelligence agency this one is, um, one agency makes you list everybody that you're uh, friends on social media with or contacts on social media, which is insane if you think about it. Um, so you have to, if you have any type of contact with foreign nationals where you you know went to college with people who might have been foreign nationals or you worked overseas if you're a military and you're a translator or your soldiers in the Iraqi army or whatever it is um, you probably have people on your uh, social media who are foreign nationals you have to go through your social media and provide those names even if you don't have close or continuing contact with them they consider that to be closer continuing contact and you have to provide those names um, that's not every agency. It's as far as I know, just one agency. Um, but for the most part, look for close or continuing contact and some type of bond. Um, let's see inconsistent dates and information on my application. Is that a big deal and why we talked about this earlier? Yes, it's a big deal because the truth is easy to remember. That's the easy answer. So save a copy of your documents. Investigators will, will play games with you and try to pin you in sometimes on. Well, what would you say the date was? And you say, I don't know. Yeah, but what would you guess the date was? I don't know. Yeah, but if you were to throw a guess out there, what would it be? And then they'll get you to commit to some crazy date that you never would have said if they didn't ask you 16 times in 16 different ways. And then the next time you go in front of an investigator, 10 years later, that investigator goes, what would you, what would you estimate? What would you say? And then you provide a different date. Now you've provided two different dates. They're not gonna put in their notes. I had to ask the question 16 times and manipulate the person to give me this answer. They're just going to put the answer and then it's going to be an inconsistent answer with the previous answer and it's going to be difficult to mitigate. So keep that in mind. Keep a copy of your applications. Don't get locked in on a specific date. If you don't know the specific date, make sure that you list it as estimated and there's boxes all over the place to check as an estimated date. All right, Ryan, you get to take the last one here. Got my security clearance more than 11 years ago. My, we've seen this recently a couple of times because of COVID. My employer hasn't mentioned a reapplication. Did I lose my clearance? Uh, so as far as reapplication, you're probably mentioning, um, you know, just uh, uh, the periodic investigation, periodic review, uh, you know, things like that. Reapplication is a little bit different. Uh, but yeah, that's my mistake. I, I, tra I, I typed it up quickly. That, you're right. But essentially, no. Um, you won't lose your clearance as long as you have that that sponsor uh, that that remains intact. Um, you know, you're fine. And to be perfectly honest, the continuing evaluation, that new process that's kind of there, is probably going to pick this up. Um, if it hasn't yet, I mean, that's obviously on your employer. But um, no, I mean, it, as, as long as you cont consistently have uh, you know your sponsor and you retain sponsorship in there, um, you know, you, you're not you'll be fine. Um, the same thing goes with if you, uh, you know, let's say that it's been more than 11 years and finally you submit your SF-86, but it's taken another year or two or, or however long it takes. It's not going to take that long, I don't think. But if it does take that long, uh, you know, and, and you're still kind of waiting, um, then, uh, you know, it, it, it's the same situation. It's not going to impact your clearance as long as you're waiting for, for that adjudication. Uh, again, unless you do something that that triggers one of the 13 uh, adjudicative guidelines, and that's obviously a different story. All right, man, it got pretty dark in my office here. <laughs> We're going to wrap this up here shortly. I'm just checking to see if we have any other uh, questions that might have come through. Um, all right, so how does a denial of a top secret clearance from my federal agency conflict with a DOD uh, top secret clearance. Ryan, you want to talk about bleed over and I'll look and see if there's any other questions here. Yeah, uh, sometimes it can, uh, you know, Tony actually mentioned this a little bit as far as, you know, reciprocity and sometimes, you know, if, if you get a, you know, denial or something from one agency doesn't necessarily mean you'll get a denial from another agency. Uh, they do take that into account. However, um, you'll, you'll notice if you've ever looked at an SF-86, I'm assuming uh, most of you did. Uh, if you look at an SF-86, it asks about past investigations. Uh, so if you were ever denied a security clearance, uh, regardless of what agency it is, you'll have to put that on there. Um, so it, it could potentially bring up some issues, but again, um, if it's a separate agency, 
um, that uh, that has a separate adjudicative body, um, then there wouldn't necessarily be a reason why you would uh, be in automatic denial or anything like that. Um, you know, so so that's kind of uh, I think I answered that question. All right, I think we got all of them. So um, thank you all for joining us. We appreciate it. Um, you know, keep your eyes open for future webinars. As I said on past webinars, we'll be doing this on a monthly basis. Um, we have the National Security Lawyers Association as well, uh, which is a group of attorneys from across uh, the country that have come together and uh, we're all uh, joined in this joint effort to um, provide resources and materials like this. Um, this will, uh, Taylor, I believe this will um, be saved and you might be able to share this with individuals if they're looking for the link for it. Um, but I'll go ahead and turn it over to Taylor now. So Ryan, thanks for joining us. And for all the all of you who tuned in, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone again for joining today today's presentation. And thank you to Ryan and Tony for presenting. Um, we will be circulating a recorded uh, version of this presentation. So be on the lookout for that. I hope everybody has a good night. Thank you.